All right, we're going to pick it up and continue on. So we're halfway through our discussion about marriage and divorce. Um, Men can marry up to four wives. Muhammad had more than that because he was given a special revelation. Um, even, and even because of that, he um, would not permit his son-in-law to take on a second wife because that would hurt his daughter. Men can, can divorce wives for any reason. Wives do not have the same um, ability to divorce their husbands. Now let's talk about a different aspect of marriage. Remember when I said that once a man issues the triple talaq, once he tells his wife, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, whether that's in succession immediately or, or spread out over a week or so, once that third divorce has been issued to the woman, it's called an irrevocable divorce. That woman cannot be reconciled back to her husband, even if she wanted to be. But miraculously, um, Muhammad provided an exception. There's always an exception to the rule. And this is one rule that Muhammad provided an exception for. If a woman has been irrevocably divorced from her husband, she can be reconciled back to that man. She can remarry him at some point in the future once she has gone through something called a muhalil marriage. Now, what in the world is a muhalil marriage? A muhalil marriage is a marriage where a woman who has been irrevocably divorced from her husband marries another man has sexual relations with him, he divorces her, and after that process has gone through, then she, can, she is now free to be remarried to her original husband. This is the provision that was allowed for in Islam. So once a woman has been irrevocably divorced, she has to marry another man, engage in sex with him, and it has to be a physical consummation, and then he divorces her, she can be remarried back to her original husband. She's no longer considered to be irrevocably divorced. And this is actually a, a, a lucrative business that goes on in some parts of the world. There are men that, that sell themselves as muhalil partners to marry women for a, a limited period of time, engage in sexual relations with them, and then divorce them so they can be remarried back to their original husband. This goes on. And this actually comes from Surah 2, verse 230, which says, So if a husband divorces his wife irrevocably, he cannot after that remarry her until she has married another husband and he has divorced her. Hold on, John. Save it for the end because I, I don't want to interrupt the camera going here. Um, but what's going on here? <clears throat> Remember, back at the beginning of the series, if you guys were here, I said that Islam contradicts the Bible in just about every aspect. Um, Jesus was, was not crucified. Jesus was crucified. It, it contradicts the Bible in, in significant aspects of theology. It also contradicts the Bible even in little issues like this. Because what is, what is Islam suggesting here? Essentially what Islam is suggesting, and this verse in the Quran is suggesting, is that in order for a woman who's been divorced to be reconciled back to her husband, she first has to commit fornication with another man. Islam requires the woman to fornicate. Remember, Jesus in Matthew 5.31 says, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate, certificate of divorce. That's what's been said in the past. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. When a man takes a wife and marries her and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he's found some uncleanness to her, he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand. He sends her out of his house, but, and when she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her as a wife, then the former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. So Surah 2, verse 230, contradicts Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4. This is a muhalil marriage. 
Now remember, I said it has to be when, when, they, when a woman marries this man for the purpose of, of engaging in a muhila marriage, she has to consummate that marriage physically. We find an example of this in, in the Hadith of Al-Bukhari, volume three, book 48, number 807 reads, the wife of Rifa al-Karazi came to the prophet and said, I was Rifa's wife, but he divorced me and it was a final irrevocable divorce. Then I married Abdurrahman bin Abu Zabir, but he is impotent. You see a problem here? The prophet asked her, do you want to remarry Rifa? You cannot unless you had a complete sexual relation with your present husband. She married another man so that, and, and she desired to be reconciled back to her first husband. Muhammad says, did you have sex with him yet? Well, no, I can't. He's impotent. Sorry, girl, you're stuck. Essentially, is what he said. <clears throat> oh, here's, here's what, I, what I mentioned earlier. Talak joke on Skype ends marriage. Talak is no joke. A, an e-savvy Qatar resident learned this the hard way when he typed Talak three times while chatting his, with his wife on Skype. He did not mean it, but the Darul Ulum Dilband has ruled that his nikah, his marriage contract, stands terminated. He played the practical joke on his wife. That's not all. For his careless chat, the man can remarry his divorced wife only after halala, only after engaging in a muhalil marriage, a practice under which a woman has to marry and divorce another man before she can marry her previous husband again. This was an, a ruling by the Islamic scholar in Qatar. So because he was careless, he chatted, he was chatting with his wife on, on Skype and he says, talak, 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 I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. The magistrates in that country said, hey, the divorce stands final and you can't have her back until she marries another man first and has sex with him. That was the ruling. Where do they get that from? They get that right out of the Quran. So muhila marriage. Um, marriage to prepubescent girls. Islam allows marriage to girls who have not yet entered puberty. Muhammad married Aisha when she was six years old and had sex with her when she was nine years old. When you look at the Quran, you find in, in Surah 65, Surah 65 is called the Surah of Talak, the Surah of Divorce. Surah 65 contains all the stipulations in Islamic law regarding marriage and divorce. What happens to a woman when she's divorced? Verse four of Surah 65 talks about the prescribed waiting period for women who undergo a divorce from their husband. There's a waiting period stipulated in Islam of three months for any woman who is divorced because they want to make sure that that woman is not pregnant before she is free to marry another man. So the three-month waiting period is, is, is a time to determine whether or not she's become pregnant due to sexual activity. Now listen to what Surah 65 verse 4 says. Speaking of the prescribed waiting period for divorce, it says, of those of your women who have passed the age of monthly courses, those women who have already entered menopause, they're no longer having their, their menstrual cycle, um, for them, the ida or the waiting period, if you have doubts about their periods, it's three months. So a woman who has, who has ceased to have her regular monthly cycle, she's entered menopause. If she's divorced from her husband, she has to wait three months before she can re remarry again to make sure she's not pregnant. That's what the first half of the verse says. The second half of the verse says, and for those who yet have no courses or they are still immature, their idda, or prescribed period, is three months likewise. Which seems to suggest, and this is what Muslim scholars interpret this verse to mean, that young girls, before they have even entered puberty and begun a regular monthly cycle, are eligible, eligible to be married to men, engage in sexual activity, and perhaps be divorced. If they haven't begun puberty yet, you still gotta wait three months to make sure they're not pregnant before they're free to be married again. Marriage to prepubescent girls. The Quran sanctions this. Otherwise, why, if the Quran didn't sanction this, what, what purpose would this verse serve being in the Quran? 
The fact that it's here suggests that this is ex- exactly what's going on. Marriage to prepubescent girls. And when we look around the world, this is exactly what we see going on. Here's an example. 40-year-old bride, 11-year-old bride. 40-year-old groom, 11-year-old bride. Here's another one. Roshan Qasem, 11, will be joining the household of Saeed Mohammed, 55, his first wife and their three sons. 11-year-old girl marrying a 55-year-old man. Um... Maja bin Muhammad, 13, 13 year old girl, at the left, sits with her husband of six months, who's 45 years old. So, prepubescent girls getting married in Islam. From the Toronto Sun, Toronto, Canada. Canada is now recognizing this to be a problem because of their immigration. Muslim child brides on the rise in Canada. Federal immigration officials say there's little they can do to stop child brides from being sponsored into Canada by much older husbands who wed them in arranged marriages abroad. This is going on in Canada, and believe it or not, it's going on in our society as well. In pockets of high Muslim concentration, like Dearborn, Michigan. My wife and I have been to Dearborn several times for the Arab festival this there every year. Um, Angie's gone with us several times as well. And it's not uncommon to, wa- to see Muslim men walking down the sidewalk of the festival route with two or three or four wives in tow behind them. Now polygamy is, is, is illegal in the United States, is it not? Yet they allow polygamous mar- unions to go on because men go abroad into their native countries, marry wives, and then bring them back. And the, the, the federal authorities or the, the local authorities just turn a blind eye to it. In the UK and in Canada, within the last two years, both the UK and the Canada have allowed Muslim husbands to apply for multiple welfare, welfare benefits for their multiple wives. You can check this out online. This is what's happening. Now, marriage to prepubescent girls... It's codified in Islamic law. الزواج قسمان القسم الأولاني عقد قران إجراء عقد القران هذا شيء والبناء يعني الدخول على الزوجة هذا موضوع آخر فأما إجراء العقد فهذا أمر يعني ليس له سن معينة في في إجراء العقد يعقد على حتى يمكن أن يعقد على على فتاة عمرها سنة زمان مش تسع سنين ولا سبع سنين ولا ثمانية سنين هذا مجرد عقد إيجاب وقبول بين بس الولي يكون هنا هو الأب لأنه ولي مجبر فتصير زوجته لكن هل هي هل الفتاة أو البنت محل للدخول أم لا طبعا وكم سن الدخول المناسب هذا يختلف باختلاف البيئات وباختلاف الأعراف عند الناس في ممكن في اليمن كانوا يزوجوا من تسعة وعشرة وإحدى عشر وثمانية وثلاثة عشر في بعض الدول تزوج من ستة عشر في بعض الدول أصدرت قوانين ألا يتم الدخول إلا بعد ثمانية عشر عام ولنا في رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قدو حسنة حيث عقد على زوجته عائشة وكان سنها ست سنوات وبنى عليها يعني دخل عليها صلى الله عليه وسلم تسع سنوات لا عقد عليها وهي ستة العقد في ستة والبناء اللي هو الدخول في تسع سنوات Hmm. So we consider Muhammad to be our model. And since he married Aisha at six years old and had sex with her at nine years old, this is what happens around the world today. So marriage to prepubescent girls. How about marriage to virgins? There seems to be in, in Islam a... 
um, an uncanny desire, an almost unhealthy desire to marry virgins. Men want to marry a virgin wife. Now think about this. This is one of the aspects where honor killing uh, comes into play quite a bit. We'll talk about honor killings a little bit later if we have time, if we get to that point. But a, a woman's honor is something that is held in very high regard in Islamic societies. And, 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 and honor means that a girl remains a virgin until she is married off to her husband. Now the, the guys, teenage guys, young men, are not required to maintain their chastity. Now think about this. Here, here, here's a, here's a, a, a contradiction, a conundrum. If the girls are expected to remain chaste until they're married, but the guys are not expected to remain chaste, who are the guys having sex with? You know? But there's an unhealthy obsession with marrying a virgin woman in Islam. And a virgin must give consent to be married. But listen to what the Hadith says. Virgins must give consent for marriage, but Malik related to me from Abdullah bin al-Fadl, a woman who has been previously married is more entitled to her person than her guardian, and a virgin must be asked for her consent, and her silence is her consent. If a, if a, if a man wants to marry off his virgin daughter to another suitor, the virgin daughter must give consent to that marriage, and her, if she says nothing, her silence is her consent. Now remember what we read earlier about men being the protectors and maintainers of women? You're not allowed to say anything negative or contrary to your, your guardian? So the girl is badgered by Islamic laws into not saying anything. And if she doesn't say anything, it's deemed to have been given consent to be married off. That's a contradiction. An obsession with virginity, even to the point today where Muslim girls are undergoing plastic surgery to have their virginity restored because they consider it a life and death situation. This is serious. Here's an article that I, that I got from the UK, I, I, uh, London Daily Mail, July 30th, 2010. I honestly viewed it as life-saving, she says. Knowing that she would have to show her bloodied wedding night sheets to her in-laws as proof of her virginity, she decided on hymen repair surgery. I honestly viewed it as life-saving, she said. If my husband could not prove to his family that I was a virgin, I would be ostracized and sent home in disgrace. My father, who is a devout Muslim, would regard it as the ultimate shame. The entire family could be cast out from their friends in society, and one of my cousins or uncles might kill me to purge them of my sins. She had her virginity restored on the public welfare dole in the UK because her life was threatened. And the UK is sponsoring this. Government health care in the UK is sponsoring these sort of surgeries today. <clears throat> Noni Darwish, in her book, Cruel and Usual Punishment, notes that her virginity is the very focus of the Muslim societal institution of honor. It is the one thing that Muslim men must protect in their female relatives in order to preserve the family's honor. The highlight of a wedding ceremony is the virginity test when the couple consummates the marriage and presents to the relatives the blood-stained bedsheet. Regarding this momentous occasion, Darwish comments, whether in public or private, the virginity check creates an atmosphere of anxiety and distrust between the bride and groom. This is the night when, sh when a girl who has never had sex before needs a tender and loving beginning, but instead she must worry about an unromantic and potentially painful act to prove that she is honorable. Because her honor is everything. So, Marriage to virgins. How about a muta marriage? What in the world is a muta marriage? Muta. A muta marriage is described um, in the hadith of, of Abu Khari. And let me just read this, this hadith narration for you first before we, we talk about this a little bit more. Um, narrated 
Abdullah. We used to participate in the holy wars carried on by the prophet and we had no women or wives with us. So we said to the prophet, shall we castrate ourselves? But the prophet forbade us to do that and thenceforth he allowed us to marry a woman temporarily by giving her even a garment and then he recited, O you who believe, do not make unlawful the good things which Allah has made lawful for you. So what's a, what's a muta marriage? A muta marriage is a situation in which a Muslim man must travel abroad or in Muhammad's time the men went off to war. A Muslim man must travel abroad. He can't take his wife with him to satisfy his natural urges but he still has those urges which must be satisfied. So what Islam allows is he, Islam allows the man to take a temporary wife. It's called a muta marriage. They sign a temporary contract. Sometimes it's, it's nothing more than a verbal agreement. They sign a contract. The man gives the man something of, or the man gives the woman something of value. It could be money. It could be a piece of jewelry. It could be an expensive garment. And in exchange for this, this thing of value given to the woman, she says, okay, now you can have sex with me as your wife. Because we're married. We've entered into a temporary legal agreement and I've temporarily agreed to be your wife for all legal intents and purposes. So the man gives the woman something of value in exchange the woman says, here's my body, use it. Now in the United States, what do we call that? Prostitution. It's prostitution garbed in, religious, garbed in a religious cloak. Because the, 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 the woman says to the man, well, we're married to each other. And it's a verbal agreement. At the end of the specified time for this temporary arrangement, the two go their separate ways. The, the wife has no right of inheritance that a normal wife would have. They have no further obligation to each other. And it's nothing more than, than a pleasure marriage for the sake of a man to take care of his natural urges when he's away from his wife. That's what a muta marriage is all about. Now many people will say, many apologists for Islam will say today that this is strictly a Shiite practice. Because Sunni Muslims will say, this is one of the differences between Shia and Sunni um, among many. Sunni Muslims will say, yeah, there was a time, it's specified in the Hadith, where Muhammad allowed temporary marriages, but he later abrogated that. He canceled that agreement and said, muta marriages are no longer allowed. Shia, on the other hand, say, well, Muhammad never abrogated that. It's still allowed for today. And so it's a, it's a practice predominantly in, in Shiite traditions, but Sunnis participate in it as well. I have a friend who used to be a missionary in Indonesia, and he told me when I, when I asked him about this issue, um, if, it, if it was in practice or in vogue in, in Indonesia, which is predominantly Sunni. He says, yeah, all the time. He says, we used to get people, we used to get men coming from Saudi Arabia, and as soon as they landed in Indonesia, they'd find a temporary wife to to shack up with. So it's very prevalent. It's what's going on. So muta marriages. <clears throat> Let's move on to the issue of sexual relations between men and women, husband and wife. In Islam, a man can have sex with his wife as often as he desires. And the woman must respond. This is, this is taken directly from the Quran. So reverse so chapter 2, verse 222 and 223 particularly. Verse 222 of chapter 2 says, they ask thee concerning women's courses, to talk about the men's menstrual cycle. Women's courses say they are a hurt and a pollution, so keep away from women when they're in their courses. Do not approach them until they are clean. But when they have purified themselves, you may approach them in any manner, any time, in any place ordained for you by Allah. The next verse, Surah 2, verse 223 says, your women are a tilth for you to cultivate. So go to your tilth as you will. The Quran tells the man that he can engage in sexual relations any time with his wife that he wants to and the woman must submit. Whether she wants to or not. There is no choice. Women have no say in the matter. And the wife must not withhold from her husband. There are many hadith that, that Allah says that uh, if, if, a woman, if a man asks the woman to come to bed and she refuses, the angels curse her until the morning. It's a curse upon a woman to refuse her husband's invitation to bed. 
this was, this was um, brought to light publicly a couple of years ago, 2008. I was talking to somebody about this during the break. In, in 2008, there was a, a couple from Morocco. They lived in, I think it was New Jersey. Yeah, New Jersey. Immigrants from Morocco. They were here living in the United States. And the woman pressed charges against her husband for spousal rape. Because he wanted sex and she said no. And he forced himself upon her. So he charged her husband, or she charged her husband with rape. It went to court. And his defense was, Judge, this is something that my religion allows me to do as a Muslim. I have committed no crime. And the judge sided with the man. He said, yes, your religion allows that. I, I can see that. You've, you've made your case, and therefore, you are not guilty of rape. Now, the case was later overturned on appeal in 2009. But I think it's pretty interesting. It's significant that the judge used, applied Sharia law, applied the religious sayings of, of Islam and allowed that husband to get away with raping his wife. Because this is what the Quran says a, a, a woman must do. So the wife must not withhold from her husband. According to Islam, women are nothing more than the objects of sexual pleasure. Sahih al-Bukhari, volume six, book 60, number 402. So as Allah's apostle said, in paradise there's a pavilion made of a single hollow pearl 60 miles wide, in each corner of which are wives who will not see those in the other corner, and the believers will be able to visit and enjoy them. So paradise is described in, in one sense as a huge 60 mile wide pearl with just women all the way across from one end to the other, which the righteous believers will be able to go, go and enjoy each woman one at a time, as he wants to because women are the objects of sexual pleasure. And then, I mentioned this earlier, um, according to Islam, according to the Quran, men can have unlimited sexual relations with female slaves. This phrase that you see repeated throughout the Quran, if, if you've been reading it, those whom your right hand possesses. Um, we talked about a, f a few weeks ago many of the battles that Muhammad went into, and when he, when he captured a, a group or a, a people or a tribe, some of the prized possessions, some of the prized spoils of war, the booty, were the women and children. The, the men were slain, and the women and children were distributed among his warriors as possessions. And the, the, the women were essentially given to Muhammad's followers as sexual slaves. That's what the phrase comes from, those whom your right hand possesses. Surah 3350. I mentioned this earlier, O prophet, we've made lawful to thee the wives whom, um, whom you paid the dowry to and those whom thy right hand possesses out of the prisoners of war whom Allah has assigned to thee. So Muslim men were allowed to engage in unlimited sexual relations with as many slave women as they had. Now here's another video for you. <laughs> في الإسلام أن تلبي رغبة زوجها في الفراش قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا الرجل دعا زوجته لحاجته فلتأته وإن كانت على التنور رواه الترمذي وحسنه ورد الوعيد الشديد للمرأة إذا عصت زوجها في الفراش وقال عليه الصلاة والسلام إذا دعا الرجل امرأته إلى فراشه فأبت فلم تأتي فبات غضبان عليها لعنتها الملائكة حتى تصبح رواه البخاري ومسلم الله يعلم حاجة الرجل ويعلم أنه قد يأتي من خارج ويمكن أن تتعلق نفسه بشيء أو رأى شيئا ويعلم هذه الحاجة ولذلك أمر المرأة أن تجيب زوجها ولو كانت على التنور لو كانت تخبز تجيبه بل إن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لما قال للمرأة انظري أين أنت منه فإنما هو جنتك ونارك رواه الإمام أحمد وهو حديث صحيح معنى ذلك أن المرأة عليها أن تلبي رغبة زوجها وتطيع المرأة في الغرب ليست مجبرة على ذلك بل عندهم قضية اغتصاب الزوج لزوجته أنه إذا أتاها رغما عنها هذا اغتصاب يعدونه اغتصابا لا بد أن تكون متهيئة لا بد أن تكون راضية هي بزعمهم والغرب منقسم في قضية النساء من هذه الناحية فمنهم من منهم من أعطى الزوج ما يريد في هذا ولكن في كثير من الحالات 
لا يعطونه الحق في هذا ولذلك عندهم لا تسلم المرأة نفسها للرجل متى ما أراد In the West they call that rape How dare they call that rape So um, continuing on We've got a lot of material to cover in 10 minutes So I'm going to run through this real quick Some of this I'm just going to gloss over According to Islam um, Girls must have their first menstrual cycle In the household of their husband Now you won't find this in the Quran But this was a, this was a claim made by um, By the Imam um, Ayatollah Khomeini after the 1979 Iranian Revolution. He got on public television and he said he called marriage to a prepubescent girl a divine blessing and advised the faithful do your best to ensure that your daughters do not see their first blood in your house. Talking to, hus- talking to fathers make sure your daughters do not see their first blood in their house in, in your house. Make sure that you get them married off before their first menstrual cycle. Again, this goes back to Surah 65, verse 4 we were talking about earlier. Islam suggests that this is perfectly acceptable. Otherwise, where would Ayatollah Khomeini have gotten this idea from? He got it straight out of the Quran. Females are punished for being raped in many societies today. Um, In Islamic societies, if, if a woman is walking down the street unaccompanied by a male guardian... Or if she's walking down the street with a, a man that she's not related to, she can be picked up by the morality police. There, in one of the books up here, I can't remember which one it was, um, a woman actually details this account that happened to her in Saudi Arabia. She was picked up by the morality police. She was taken to a location in the desert and she was raped repeatedly. Why? Because she didn't have her guardian with her. And being a woman out on the streets alone suggests that you're out there to present yourself to whoever might want to pick you up. You're a victim of rape. And because you are raped, you are the one that is responsible for it. So you are the one that endures the punishment. You're punished first by being raped by a man and then you're punished the second time by punishment for allowing yourself to be raped. Now, if a woman is raped, she can actually present a case. She can try to go to court to prove her case that she was overcome physically. She didn't, um, she was not, it wasn't voluntary. It wasn't a voluntary act. She didn't give her consent. But she must produce four male witnesses to the event. Islamic law, Sharia law, this manual right here, says for any crime, if a woman wants to press charges, she must have four male witnesses to present evidence of the crime of, of the crime being occurred. Four male witnesses must testify that she saw the woman being raped and she saw the woman as this act of rape was going on trying to push her aggressors away. Showing that it was not voluntary. If she can't produce four witnesses then it is deemed that she has voluntarily engaged in illicit sexual intercourse. And so she is punished for engaging in Adultery. This is the reality of what goes on today. <clears throat> um, running through this. Are girls, are young girls, ready for the results of marriage? Islam allows prepubescent girls to be married. But is, is this the model for society today? In Yemen... September 13, 2009, Yemeni 12 year old dies while giving birth to a stillborn baby. 12 year old girl was married off as a child bride, got pregnant, her body wasn't ready for it yet, and she died. Again, Yemeni child bride tied up and raped, says mom, and she died. She was married off, 13 years old. Her husband exercised his privilege of marriage against the wife. He, she was his wife. He called her. He forced himself upon her. 
brutally raped her, and she died as a result of the injuries that she suffered. Now, these are the ones that are reported in the media. How many are going on today in, in the remote outskirts of some bi- villages that we never hear about? This is the reality. <clears throat> 2004, a 16-year-old girl, Atef Rajabi, was hanged in public square in Iran. Her crime? Rajabi was charged with adultery, which probably means she was raped. Her rapist was not executed, but Rajabi told the mullah judge that he ought to punish men who rape, not their victims. The judge both sentenced and personally hanged Rajabi because in addition to her crime, he said she had a sharp tongue. November 1st, 2008, a 13-year-old girl in Somalia was stoned to death after being raped by three men. She was unable to produce the required four witnesses to the rape and was therefore accused of adultery as required by Sharia. It was reported that the girl begged for mercy before being buried waist high in the ground and pummeled to death by a mob of 1,000 men. These are all news reports you can find online. I'm not making this stuff up. These are all news reports that I pulled off the internet. Now, you're going to love this next video clip. Because this girl, this lady, is going to discuss all the things that we've been talking about up to this point. She's a female activist. She's a, a, a female activist for women's rights in Bahrain, a very moderate Islamic society by, by standards, by our standards. Um, but listen to what she says. She's going to talk about the abuses that women go through today and are still going through. And she's one of a few lone voices that dare to have the courage in Islamic society to stand up and say, this is wrong, this must stop. But she faces an uphill battle because many of the things that she documents, as we've talked about this morning, are founded and based upon authentic teachings in the Quran and authentic sayings by Muhammad. Remember, Surah 33, verse 21, says of Muhammad, you have in the Prophet of Allah an example to follow. Muhammad is considered to be be the model. And so when Muhammad does these things as recorded in the Hadith, Muslims are obligated to follow them. Nobody has the right to say these are wrong as this woman has the guts and courage to do. Check her out. الحين احنا وصلنا الى مرحلة خلاص وصلنا الى مرحلة طيب الانهيار احنا عندنا مشكلة تحديد النسل احنا ما عندنا تحديد نسل في البحرين والشيعة يتزوجون متعة في البحرين ويعني وينجبون اطفال بلا عدد وبلا حساب والشارع ربي زين شيء طبيعي اذا, إذا الاب يتزوج فلبينية ويتزوج بحرينية ويتزوج واحدة ثالثة من ايران ويأخذ له متعة ثنتين ثلاث من هني كم طفل بيجيب؟ في 12/9 صرحتي تصريحا بانك تدعين او تد... تطالبين وتنصحين الخليجيات والبحرينيات بالذات المضطهدات باللجوء الاجتماعي الى فرنسا. يعني تبغين معارضه من الخارج، عفوا الى اسبانيا. لان وزير تبين... الوزير تبين معارضه من الخارج. مو مو خ... مو القصد انه ي... معارضه من الخارج، الق... القصد ان اهما يحتمون يحتمون او يعيشون في بلد امن. لأن يعني إذا المرأة ما حصلت على الأمان في بلدها ما حصلت على الأمان في محاكمها ما حصلت على الأمان في بيت الزوجية طيب وين تروح وين تروح في ناس يقولون أنه غادة جمشير سنية وبالتالي هي ترفع اللواء ضد زواج مقرر شرعا عند الشيعة مقرر شرعا عند الشيعة مقرر شرعا الشريعة الإسلامية أقرت المتعة أقرت المتعة اللي بهذه التصنيفة اللي أنا بقولها لك التمتع بالمفاخذة عندهم التمتع بالملامسة زين التمتع بالمكعبة التمتع بالصغيرة التمتع بالصغيرة تعرف شنو معناتها معناتها يتمتعون بالطفل اللي عمرها سنتين طيب. ثلاث سنين أربع سنين طيب عشان ما ندخل بس في التمتع تفصيلات. بالمفاخذة خلاص راح لك لا 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 هذه ضد حقوق الطفل هذه يعتبر هذه يعتبر اعتداء جنسي على الطفلة 
يعني المت... التم... التمتع بالمفاخذة شنو ذي؟ التمتع بالرضيعة معناه تري زين الرضيعة يعني كم عمرها؟ طيب. سنة طيب. سنة طيب. ونص أشهر بس... يعني هل يعقل هل يعقل رجل بالق يمارس الجنس مع طفل طيب رضيعه طيب بس بس وتقولون لي الشريعه الاسلاميه احلت هذه الامور خل المتعه المسيار شنو معنات المسيار؟ تقول انا شي انا سنيه واهاجم الشيعه لا يعني انا اقول هل في ناس يقولون زي كذا لا 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 انا بقول لك المسيار شنو هو؟ المسيار شنو هو؟ يعني يتزوج واحده في بلد ثانيه ويروح يسير عليها في الشهر مره يزورها اسمها الزوجة هذا النوع من الزيجات مش بالضرورة بالشهر ممكن كل يوم كل يوم تركي هذا النوع من الزيجات هذا النوع من الممارسات تحط من كرامة المرأة كإنسان طيب. المرأة طول عمرها محبوسة في البيت ما تخرج إلى العمل السنين اللي فاتت ما تخرج للدراسة برا ما تسافر برا تدرس السنين اللي فاتت فئة بسيطة منهم فئة بسيطة اللي تسافر وتدرس في في الجامعات برا البحرين أو في ال يعني زين موجودة في البيت للطبخ وللكنس ولتربية الأطفال من وين تيه الثقافة من وين تيه الثقافة وفي بعض النساء يعني أهاليهم متشددين يتزوجونهم حتى زواج إجباري إذن أنت قول لي ليش تمارس عادة الختان إلى اليوم في الوطن العربي ليش لأن ما في ثقافة ما في تثقيف ما في توعية ما في توعية يعني من كم يوم توفت بنت اسمها أنعام أربع سنوات عمرها في السودان ليش؟ ممارسة الختان صادها تسامم في الدم أربع سنوات أنا على ثقة على ثقة كاملة بأني أنا اللي قلته كله واللي سويته حق مئة في المئة طيب من ضمن الأشياء اللي وجهتي فيها أنت كفرتي في بعض الأماكن منتديات انترنت عادي صحيح ما كفروني حتى على المسايد عادي طيب. هل تعتقدين حسب هاي الكلام أنا أثر فيني طيب. ما يكفروني ما يهمك ما يهمك لان الله سبحانه وتعالى هو اللي حدد انا ادخل الجنه او ادخل النار ما تعتقدين ان هذول اللي كفروك اللي كفروك ما تعتقدين انهم هذه الاساليب ضعيفه يستخدمونها انهم يقولون كلمه الحق انت قاعد تقولين انا اقول كلمه الحق ومن اعطاهم الاذن انهم يكفروني ومن اعطاك الاذن ليش ما ادخلوا في قلبي علشان يعرفون انا هم يقولون انه انه شافوني اصلي ولا ما اصلي مطروحاتك بس ولا لان ما على راسي حجاب إذا ما تهتمين بي ما تتأثرين بي مول مول كلش وش ال وش ولا يحرك فيني شيء واو يا شي ستيل لايف اتس انترستنج ذو افتر ذيس انترفيو اون تي في شي واز نيفر لاود اون تي في اجين شي واز شي واز بان فروم ذا اير ويفز I wonder why, yeah. What a fireball, though. We need more women like her. So there are a few lone voices like that standing up for women's rights in the Arab world, but as I said, they have an uphill battle ahead of them. Um, real quickly, dress requirements. This is why women cover themselves up in Islamic societies. Why? Well, number one, because it's found in the Quran. But the main reason they cover up is to control the sexual desires of men. Women bear the responsibility of making sure that men maintain their control. This is why they, they wear these, these tents over them, to disguise their femininity. That's the whole idea behind wearing the shador, or the burqa. This comes from Surah 33, verse 59. O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to draw their veils over their bodies that will be better that they should be known as respectable women and not to be annoyed. Not to be annoyed by who? <laughs> not to be annoyed by men. Which seems to suggest if a woman fails to draw her veil over her body, if she, if she fails to wear the veil in public and exposes her feminine physique, she's liable to be a victim, and that's exactly what happens in those societies. That's why women are raped. This is a fairly recent phenomenon, as you'll see in this next clip. This is Cairo in the 1970s. We could be in any large city in any Mediterranean country. 
not a veil in sight. This is Cairo today. There are very few Muslim women who would walk through streets like this unveiled. But if Islam is firmly rooted in the Quran, and the Quran is the ultimate and changeless message of God, how are these differences and changes possible? Hmm. One more short clip. This is another woman who's a women's activist in Egypt. And she's trying to speak out against women. I have read the Quran many times. I have read the Hadith. I have read interpretations of the Quran. And it is my personal belief that I'm not required to wear the hijab. And 15 years ago, I could have engaged in a discussion with men of religion over that. Today, it is almost impossible to engage in a discussion of that detail. If you say that, it is blasphemous. Hmm. It's blasphemous. If you dare engage in a discussion over wearing the veil, over wearing the hijab or the chador or the burqa, depending on what society you're in, if you dare challenge the authorities today, it's considered blasphemy. And blasphemy in, in Islam is punishable by death. It's a capital crime. Um, I don't have time to go on, go on into detail on this. We got, we're out of time. Um, but honor killings are a huge problem. I mentioned during the break to a couple of people just recently, uh, I think last month, in Canada, a, a year-long trial wrapped up. It's called the Shafia family, S-H-A-F-I-A. -A. Shafia family is an honor-killing situation that occurred in Canada in 2008. They finally went to trial last month, or 2009. And Mr. Shafia, the husband, his second wife and his son killed his first wife and their three daughters because they were becoming too westernized or he didn't, he didn't want them anymore. He wanted to get rid of his wife. This is a huge problem going on in the world. Here's, here's some pictures of recent honor killing victims. Um, Axel Parvez in Canada, Amina and Sarah Said in Dallas, Texas were shot to death by their Egyptian father because they were becoming too westernized. They were wearing western clothes against his will. He put them into his taxi cab, drove them to a, an isolated area around Dallas, shot them to death and fled to Egypt. He's never been found. The Shafia sister, that's one I was just talking about there in, in the middle. Noor al-Maleki in Phoenix. Her trial was just earlier uh, last year. Noor al-Maleki was run down by an SUV driven by her father because she was becoming too westernized. Honor killings are becoming more and more of a problem. And this is specifically an Islamic problem. Now, when you... When you face Muslims with this particular issue, and I, I raised this issue with the Imam of the Chino Valley Islamic Center not too long ago. He says, well, you know what, there's, there are, um, you know, there's domestic violence in every society. You know, that's, that's the usual escape clause. Well, every society has domestic violence. Well, that's, that's true. Every society does have domestic violence, but not to the level that we see going on in Islamic societies. And why? Because women are not held in a high regard in Islamic societies, as we've gone through for the last two hours today. Women are nothing more than disposable possessions that a man can dispose of as he wishes. That's why honor killings are so prevalent. Um, British girl of 10 years kept in Saudi hellhole for 11 years by her dad. This is a news report that made the news last year. Hannah, 21, makes dramatic escaped after over a decade in Jeddah. She was kept as a virtual prisoner in her own home by her father. And the article that appeared in the, I uh, can't remember, I think this was, this was the, the Times of UK, um, just gave detail by detail of, of the issues that she had to face and the abuse that she had to put up with um, at the hands of her father. Um, Female circumcision, I'm not, I'm not going to dwell on this. There's some, in, there's some material in your notes you can read about. Ayan Hirsi Ali is a female activist who grew up as a Muslim woman in um, Somalia. 
She's written several books. She's now, she's, she's no longer a Muslim. She's essentially an atheist. And she's written two, written two books, one called Infidel and the other one called The Caged Virgin. In her book Infidel, she relates her experience of being circumcised as a young girl in Somalia. And this is something that goes on in the Muslim world today. Now, this is not strictly an Islamic practice. It's, it, it's really a carryover from ancient African tribal religions. It got its start in Africa. And so it's not strictly an Islamic practice. There are other African religious cultures that also engage in female circumcision. But Islam is the only religious system in the world that has codified this particular um, procedure in Islamic law. Imam Shafi, in this manual right here, says, circumcision is obligatory for both males and females. And it describes the procedure. And I won't describe the procedure. You've got it in your notes. But this is something that goes on around the world today. The term that we've given to this procedure in the West is female genital mutilation because that's exactly what goes on. That's exactly what goes on. Um, gosh, we're out of time. Let me skip this next video and just go to the, 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 the summary here. Are men and women equal? Does Islam honor women? Not from what we've seen today. There is no honor for women in Islam. Short video clip to wrap it up. Men and women entirely equal in Islam. Any disparity is cultural, nothing to do with Islam. Let's hear some of those verses from the Quran. Men are the managers of women's affairs in that God has preferred one over the other. Meaning that the man is financially responsible for the family and supplying all their needs. Men are a degree above women. But the woman is equal to the man in everything that touches human feelings. Love, trust, confidence, pride, respect and honor. Those wives you fear may be rebellious, admonish, banish to their couches and beat them. Islam says through the Quran that beating is appropriate for a certain type of woman. Not all women. This teaching applies to the woman who disobeys her husband and refuses to live in her house and refuses to raise her children and wants to go out whenever she pleases and wants no one to control her and is unwilling to fulfill her duties. Your wives are land to be tilled, so till your land when and how you will. This is an honoring of women. Women are not the property of a man. They are like the fertile land that her husband takes care of and doesn't exhaust. Mm. Do you see how those verses were twisted into something that they were never meant to be? All right, I've got to play this next one. Give me a little grace. You guys have to watch this next one. Check. Um, and by the way, have, have your tissue ready. This is a radio talk show where a woman calls in. It's a Christian talk show that, that is satellite broadcast into the Middle East. And just listen to this woman. You'll see the, uh, you'll see the subtitles on the screen. Hello? Hello? Sayyida Sana? Hello? 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 أهلا بك حقيقة هذه أنا مرتبكة شوية حيت هذه أول مرة كنكلم في البرنامج مباشرة معليش أنا اللي استفدني بزاف هو واحد الأخ مغربي كنهاجمك كنهاجمك بكلمات هابطة بزاف وسوقية وكنتأسف لك بزاف زعما 
معلش بزاف معلش احنا نحن متعودين خلاص <تصفيق> نقول انا شنقول انا متبع البرامج ديالك والبرامج ديال الاستاذ احمد مع مع زكريا بطرس نعم وانا مغربي انا مغربيه مسلمه نعم يا عند دابا وليت كنمي المسيحيه بزاف من خلال البرامج ديالكم عرفت الحقيقه نعم نشكر نشكر الرب يعني وما الذي يمنعك حتى انك تقبل انا مزوجه انا مزوجه ورجلي رجلي مسلم متعصب ومخبي عليه هذا الشيء نعم يقدر يقدر يقني واحد ديال الاولاد وهذا ما نقدرش ما بقيتش ولادي انا 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 اختي اختي سناء هي تقول تقول بغيتو بلادي تقولو لي مسيحيين نقولو لك الى راجلي عرف الحقيقة وهذا يقدر يطلق لي ويا اختي الاولاد نحن نثق ان ان الله يحفظ الانسان هذه علاقة شخصية ومسؤولية اختي نحن مررنا من نفس الشيء والكثير منا يعني عذب ومر من مراحل صعبة وانا تعاطف معك جدا حتى اني انفعلت شخصيا لكن الاخت ربما الناس الذين لا يفهمون الدارجة المغربية هي قالت بان تريد ان تقبل انا انا استطيع اتكلم باللغة العربية نعم من فضلك حتى يفهم الناس بزاف ما نقدرش فهمتين ما انا ما وجدتش الكلام اللي غادي نقوله هذا نعم فهمتي دابا انا ماشي كان عند قلبي اللي كيهدر نعم انا ما مش حاجه ما اقتنعش بالاسلام هي هي تقول بان بان اقتنعت اقتنعت برساله المسيح وتريد ان تقبل سيد المسيح في حياتها لكن يمنعها ان تفكر في زوجها وانه ممكن يطلقها وكذلك اطفالها الى اخره فهي في وضعيه صعبه جدا انا اشرح للمشاهدين الذين لم يفهموا صلي لها اخر شيء صلي لها أنا حقيقة ما كاين ليست هناك حرية في العقيدة الإسلامية، ليست هناك حرية. خلينا خلينا نصلي لك صلاة الأخت سناء. شكرا كثير شكرا. أخت أخت سناء قبل ما نبتدي نصلي ارفعي قلبك للرب واطلبيه وهو هيجي لك. الرب الرب دايما هيكون معاكي. يا ريت تكرري ورايا يا ريت تكرري ورايا من فضلك. يا إلهي الحنان أيها الآب العطوف أشكرك يا رب على نعمك يا رب أشكرك على نعمك يا رب أشكرك يا رب على محبتك يا رب أشكرك يا رب على محبتك يا رب أشكرك إنك أرسلت ابنك الوحيد عشان يموت عني أنا فوق عود الصليب أشكرك لأنك أرسلت ابنك الوحيد عشان يموت عني أنا في الصليب أنا أتوب عن خطيتي يا رب وأعترف بيك مخلص وإله يا رب. أنا أتوب عن خطيتي يا رب وأعترف بيك مخلص يا رب. أنت هو الإله الحق يا رب خلصني يا رب. أنت هو الإله الحق يا رب خلصني يا رب. يا رب أعني واحفظني واحفظ زوجي وعيالي. يا رب أعني واحفظني واحفظ زوجي وعيالي. يا رب نور طريقي ووريني طريقك فين وعلمني سبلك يا رب. عشان امشي في سبلك المستقيمه يا رب انا اصلي لك من كل قلبي انك تحفظ اختنا سناء يا رب انك تكون معاها في محنتها نحن نحس بما تحس به لان مررنا في نفس الشيء يا رب يا رب أنت تفهم أنت عارف قلوبنا أنت عارف بالقلوب وبالظروف وكل شيء أنت أقوى من كل شيء يا رب يا رب احفظها حافظ على حياتها يا رب هي لا تريد فقط زوجها يا رب المس قلب زوجها وقلب أولادها يا رب نسلمها بين يديك لأنك أنت لا تضيع وداعك يا رب باسم يسوع المسيح آمين She wants to become a Christian, but she can't because of what her husband will do to her. This is the bondage that women find themselves in, not only overseas, but here in our own country. <clears throat> and I hope 
that you walk away today, number one, understanding better the plight of women, Islamic women, Muslim women. And I hope that stirs you to action. Because as you women, they're going to have to reach out and love to these Muslim women. Here's the truth. Here's, here's the hope we have to give them. You have this chart in the back of your notes. In the area of equality, in the area of sexual relations, in the area of marriage, the area of divorce, the authority of the man over the woman, the area of modesty, Islam treats women with disdain, but Christianity exalts women. Women can only have hope through the blood of Jesus Christ. This is where their hope is going to be found. This is where their rescue is going to come from. This is the message we have to get out to Muslim women who find themselves in a hopeless situation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. God, our hearts go out to women around the world who find themselves virtually prisoners in their own home and the desperation that they go through on a daily basis. Father, use us as, as tools. Use us as, as your ambassadors to reach out with love to these women and give them a hope for the future that they can only know through knowing your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and gives them a hope of eternal life. Father, we ask for your blessing in, in helping us reach these dear, precious people whom you've created and you love. In Jesus' name, amen.